I should say, and something that uh, I don't think the organizers will, will know, is that I really owe a huge amount to legal in general. Because when I was back in northeast of England in 1980, setting up what became one of uh, 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 very early uh, social enterprises, although we didn't have the language in those days, it was legal in general that became our first big corporate backer and gave huge support, not just in financial terms, but in advocacy and in opening doors for us and in mentoring and giving a, a great deal of help. And I'm delighted to say that that Project Northeast organization is still going strong almost 40 years later, and indeed next year we will be celebrating 40 years. So Nigel, welcome. Thank you very much indeed. As a CEO, right there in, in, in the front line, do these wider questions about the purpose and the responsibilities that a business like LNG has to take, do you see they fit in in any way with employee well-being? Uh, I think absolutely. I think the uh, the leadership shown by lots of the firms on the on the charts that you put up is is self-evidently true. And as I wonder, I, I allow everybody in our firm to see me at least once a year in a public forum like this and have an opportunity to ask me questions. And some of the questions are about the financial performance, but a lot of them are about personal things, how we can become a better company, both internally and, and externally. And we want to be one firm with one set of values, one set of beliefs, and one set of behaviors everywhere in the world, because we want to be that globally trusted brand, dealing with big economic and societal problems everywhere. And what's fantastic around the world to see at the moment is these, this movement isn't uh, restricted to a little bit of the UK and a little bit of the United States and bits of Europe. It's everywhere. I've just returned from some time in, in California, in Tokyo, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. And I spent as much time talking about ESG in those countries as I do here. Sorry, ESG, just for, just for the un any un uninitiated? It's environmental issues, social issues, and governance issues that have to be resolved everywhere in the world. Because unless we collaborate and coordinate around the world, the big issues around, uh, around climate change, about poverty, about exclusion, are not going to get resolved unless everybody believes these are really good goals to get at. And the, definitely the impression I get now from traveling around the world is there's a huge amount of corporates want to do the right thing, but there are only sparks at the moment. There are sparks of light being produced com compared to the enormity of the problem that we have to deal with. Um, we heard about the Stevenson Farmer report, and I'm proud to say Dennis is one of my close friends, has been one of my friends for uh, many, 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 many years. And the consequences of mental health are horrible to see and horrible to observe, and we're all starting to do bits about it, but the economic cost to it is a truly staggering cost. The personal cost of it is absolutely staggering. Now, I know a CEO that if I suffer from any mental health issues, it'll get resolved. Both the money is there and the support systems are there. But I want to know that the person who's under stress in our call center in, in, in the UK on a Friday, where they're just feeling absolutely worn out, don't know how they're gonna cope, there's a mechanism for dealing with them. So we have about um, one mental health first aider for every 70 people who work for our organization. and. You know, it's about the same number as physical first, first aiders because actually there are more mental health issues raised at work than that's physical issues r right now. And we want people to have access to what, what we think of as our concierge service, is that you have access to cognitive behavioral therapists who will help you, who are professional, will help you, and not just the people internal to our firm. And this goes back to the issue that Actually, we're just starting to solve these problems because we, we increased uh, awareness of it and we've got an authentic approach to it. But actually, unless we have lots of, uh, lots of evidence that we're really doing it, our colleagues are going to be cynical about it because th they don't see enough attention by the CEOs, the board, and the senior leaders, or even their direct manager, because their direct manager is under such pressure, you know, they've got good financial goals, financial objectives, they're driven non-stop in, in many instances to, to execute on these. But we, we, we must remember that we, 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 that can't be the only purpose that we have in business. And you recognize that in your ex excellent book, but I think lots of CEOs are recognizing that right now, that actually we do have this wider purpose and we need to deliver on that wider purpose. And we have to be authentic about it. You know, I was always struck by the, 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 the Trump dinner at uh, Blenheim when they were, we were all given instructions as to how to get there. 
and one of them was on the train. And I went on the train with my uh, din dinner jacket and dicky bow on. And when we got to the station, I got off. I was the only one. Everyone else had either driven there or flown in there on their private jets. And it's fine to talk about these things, but you've got to walk them as, right. as well. And, and if, if chief executives don't behave in the way that they're characterizing their aspirations for their company and the authenticity that you talked about, then we'll fall short. Right. So we have to be you know, setting the tone from the top and walking the talk. I think that, that, that's so important. Now, I would be very remiss if I didn't remind everybody that we have the Slido system. So if you would like to start posing questions to Nigel, we've already got, got one up there, but let's, let's get a few coming in. Vote if you think there's a really important question that you would feel terribly cheated if we have not covered before the end of, of, of this session. And I'll try and keep a, a, an eye on the, the questions as they come in. But I'm just going to carry on. In the meantime, just, just for a, a little bit asking um, uh, Nigel, so that's really interesting, your, your, your very recent experiences going around in California and Tokyo and China and so on, as, 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 as you were saying. So from your perspective as, as, as a CEO of an international business, when we talk about some of the, 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 the wider issues around the responsibilities that a business has, it's, it's not just... A, 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 a kind of rich world kind of, 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 of mentality. You, you do see this as something which is, is, is much more global. It, it, is, it is absolutely global. And uh, certainly um, institutional investors, and I saw one of the questions coming up there, we have to have a long-term view. We've been around since 1836. And we, if, we if we've got a magic wand, we'd abolish quarterly reporting uh, tomorrow, you know, which, which is, you know, in our view, is just a complete um, you know, it's a waste of time and, and effort. And we, we, we don't get rewarded on short-term uh, uh, performance. It's definitely the long-term performance that really matters. And we invest in companies for the very long term. A lot of our investment is called uh, uh, passive investing or in index investing, but it's very active investment. It's active investment because we have to hold the shares for long periods of, of time, in fact, forever. forever. And we manage, as, as Pumbly pointed out earlier, 1.1 trillion of, of assets. Now, a billion for us almost seemed a big number, I and mean, none of us knew what a trillion was until uh, RBS confessed that they had two of them <laughs> on, their on their balance sheets. And... Um, but it's an enormous amount of, of assets, but an enormous responsibility. And we're absolutely not trying to maximize the returns on a quarterly basis for that. We're taking a very long-term view of what are the right companies to invest in, but also what's the behavior of those companies. And it aligns with our own sets of values and behaviors as well, because we don't want people to pollute the world. We don't want people to engage in, in the, wrong, the wrong things. We want people to do the right thing for the right reasons and deliver the right outcome. And that's, that's wh what we have to be as legal in general. Now, we've got some incredibly shy people in the room because mm. uh, everybody is, so far is, 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 is anonymous. So um, th th there was a question um, that I, I just saw there about um, your, your LGIM um, strategies yeah. and about uh, really challenging. And, 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 and the question, I think, was, was, was talking about are most um, in, 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 in investors uh, still after the, 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 the short-term results? So, do you want no? I, I, and it's interesting. The the biggest investor in um, in Japan, and I was with uh, uh, both in the UK and indeed in, in Japan, and they're all about DSG. They're all about you know investing for the for the for the long term, because they've got this accountability to provide pensions for the long term. And if you're providing pensions you're looking at the 20, 30, 40, even 50 year return. And, it, and you want to invest in things that r deliver great societal outcomes because you know that's the best long-term solution for, ev for everyone. And there's a huge number of firms on the slide that you're putting up there. But we're only still scratching the surface. You know, carbon emissions are still going up at the same rate they've been going up for long periods of time, despite our best efforts. So that's why your book, book's are very relevant. It, it is have to. We all have to be all in. We all have to do really big changes to our, our lifestyles and the way that co corporates behave to have a much better societal outcome. Otherwise, we're just doing a, a, a little bit of stuff r right now. And we really have to do much bigger stuff on a bigger scale and really get everybody working together uh, on this. And you know, I would have a, a national program to um, retrofit all households and make them you know, c 
uh, carbon friendly. Um, there's, you know, there's $12 trillion, $12 trillion in the world right now with negative nominal yields. And a negative nominal yield means if you give me 10,000 pounds today, I will give you back 9,500 pounds in 10 years' time. And if anybody wants to sign up for that, I'll meet them outside. But that's what $12 trillion in the world is doing. So from a societal point of view, what we have to do is get that $12 trillion that's over here and invest all in all these incredible projects that there are around the world to make the world a better, better place. And if you can't beat a negative nominal interest rate on investing the money, that's a poor societal outcome. And there's $12 trillion of this. This is not like there's a little bit of money sloshing around doing this. The world's awash with money. We're short of ideas, we're short of investable ideas that we can drive through the complexities of planning processes and political processes and corporate governance processes because people think of, um, uh, of certain types of, uh, of activities of engagement as the outcome, but the outcome has to be a measurable societal outcome which results in massive reductions in carbon, huge increase in employing, employee well-being, and we're still beginning to measure those things right now. Thank you. Now, there was a great question um, that slipped, just slipped a, a, a away from a moment, but somebody was asking for advice about how to persuade their CEO um, to integrate well-being and sustainability and long-term view and purpose and so on. Uh, and I think also we suggested uh, how do we get our CEO to take the train more as well. Um, so I'm sure all the train operating companies here will, will, be, will, will, will be pleased to hear, hear more about that. But more seriously... How do you convince maybe one of the, the CEOs that sometimes so, some of your LGM colleagues say, Nigel, would you have a... a no, I, I, I do that. I mean, I, I, my advice would come and see me about it because I think it's worked. I mean, we're an incredibly successful organization because we have this u unique culture uh, of doing things. And we want our colleagues to be emotionally engaged in these metrics that really matter. And feel a sense of pride, you know, that tr we've, we've transformed Salford, we've transformed Cardiff, we're transforming Leeds. We want to put back in the community a lot of the money that we made el elsewhere and invest for the long, long term. We originally had a 15 billion pound program for the, for the UK, we'll certainly be launching another 15 billion pound program. And that's almost 1% of GDP that we can do easily as legal in general. In fact, there isn't a limit to how much we can do. Our limit is constrained by the aspirations and ambitions of the communities in which we, we operate in. And if people w could just step up and want to change and build a better world, really, uh, then there's so much more that we, that we can do. Because the science and technology that's being produced by young people at universities right now is so exciting. And they're actually solving these big societal issues from a science and technology viewpoint. We're just not backing them enough with enough money right now when all this money is sitting on the sideline and just the regulatory hurdles, political hurdles, intercompany hurdles are just too big at the moment for us to get over quick enough. And that's why everybody in this room has a huge contribution because we're all converts of what's the right thing to do from a societal point, point of view. And the academic research, like, like the work that you've been producing, says it's the right thing to do for the long term for businesses. And this excessive focus that we saw for quite a period of time on short term earnings and people being obsessed about it really delivered the wrong outcomes from a societal point of view. And we as long term investors discourage people from going for the short term earnings and absolutely going for the long term correct societal solutions as well. And I think that is, is, is an incredibly important point. And if anyone does still doubt that, there's a very short Harvard Business Review blog by two of the best young professors um, in, in, in the business right now, Yanis Yanu from the London Business School, George Serafine at Harvard, back in February, explaining how and why sustainability pays for, uh, for, for, for business. Now, we had some really interesting questions, Nigel, um, and it, in a way, ec sort of echoed something that Janet said in, 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 in the previous contribution around CEOs, like everyone else, needing to have plenty of sleep. Um, so how do you reconcile um, sort of your own sort of health and, and, and well-being with the pressures of being CEO of a global business and this kind of 24-7 kind of, 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 of culture? So I don't know whether we can have that, find that, 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 that question to... Uh, to go back up, Katie, but um, if we can find it, it was about 24-7. Yeah, I mean, I, I do live a 24-7 life, and I sleep on aeroplanes uh, quite, quite frequently. Uh, 
but I'm in great physical shape because I look after myself. I actually want to walk, walk the talk. I walk to work uh, every day. I use public transport all, all, all the time. I eat really, really well. I am carbon aware in the sort of life that I, that I, that I lead because, and you know, family comes first, fitness and health and well-being comes you know, right up there at the, at the top. And so for everybody who comes into my office, uh, my office is always open, and I want to get ideas off them as well when they come into my office, is that um, I can live that, that life. I still compete as an athlete, and if, if, if I can do it as a, as a CEO, uh, other people can do this uh, as well. It, you know, and, and it's just a matter of figuring out how do you want to manage your life, and what are the things that really matter, matter to you, and what's high up on the, on the priority, uh, priority list. You know, I was away the last uh, bits of the last two weekends, so I'm taking tomorrow off. I'm taking tomorrow off so I can do some more family things that I couldn't do because I was away a little bit of time. And if I do it, I know other colleagues will, will do it. If I'm in the office at you know, 6 and staying till 10 every night, that just encourages really bad behavior. And I know pe I don't want fatigued, worn out people. I want you know bright, inspirational, driven people who realize that doing the right thing really matters and behaving in the right thing really matters. So um, if people... You know, have to go home early uh, and do things for the family. Absolutely fine with me. So maybe we could combine the question from Zoe um, and also the question from Paul from Orange Business Services because um, the Zoe question um, is around. So can you give us a tangible example um, of where you put um, sustainability before profit? I suspect maybe we, we might want to rephrase that a little bit and. And, 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 and think about it as, as to sustainability as a way to uh, better profits, but that, that's showing my bias. And there's the question also from Paul from Orange Business Services was about how do you persuade people to, um, that this is not just a bit of, of, of kind of PR and, 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 and clever marketing uh, and, and, and so on. Um, yeah, they're, they're very they're very valid questions, I, and we, we've got so much evidence inside the side the firm that nobody asks that question uh, 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 anymore. Because uh, there are, you know, we we you were talking about entrepreneurship. We we have funded uh, 200 startups in in Britain in the last probably 18, 18 months, and a huge number internally as well. Because of that, you know, entrepreneurship's massively exploding in the UK, and entrepreneurship's massively exploding internal to legal and general. Some of those are not designed you know, to make uh, a profit. We, we think of them as a door leading to a door. If actually, if we do this activity, there's a good chance that some uh, good solutions will come out which will be commercial in their, in, their own, in their own right. And much of our early work on urban regeneration and housing was very much in those, in, in, along those lines where we weren't ne necessarily going to make money in, in the short period what, whatsoever. It was... Uh, uh, test and learn, test and learn, uh, experiment, try and figure out using you know, uh, lots of modern, uh, modern techniques how we can make a sustainable, profitable business. And we have to be a profitable business. And I always talk to our regulators, it's no good regulating unprofitable businesses because they're really difficult to regulate. And you have to regulate profitable businesses because we have to invest. And the only reason that we've got 1.1 trillion is that we've been a profitable, successful business with these values and behaviors. And we, win, we, win, we manage money in China. We have no office in China. We've managed money for Korea and, 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 and Japan. We have no, until recently, we had no offices there either. So people are giving us incredible trust because of our values and behaviors. Because rest assured, legal in general is not a household name in China. In fact, very, we had T-shirts present, present, um, printed for us. And they came out as general and legal. So we realized that the brand <laughs> wasn't quite as well known as we'd hoped in, uh, in China, e even amongst people who were supportive uh, of, of, of us as a, f as a firm. We finance research in universities, which you know, a lot of it we know will be unsuccessful. But in photovoltaic cells, we've got some ch chaps that we are uh, producing you know, the most sophisticated advanced cells. Our great plea for that is it will be developed in the UK, manufactured in the UK, and sold from the UK, which in the past, it's never been that. It's been developed in the UK, manufactured elsewhere, and sold and, uh, around the world. And we have to get these businesses which have got great models to become great businesses in, here in the UK and not sold to the Americans or sold to the Europeans or sold to people from the Far East. And therefore, we want people to, be, to, to, to invest for the long term. And we're absolutely a long-term investor. 
and, and anyone who's interested specifically in this point about encouraging intrapreneurs, uh, people inside the large organization with, with entrepreneurial ideas, take a look at the League of Intrapreneurs website. Great set of, 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 of resources uh, on, on there. Um, uh, can I just say something? We have a business called Salary Finance, which some of you may know we, 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 we bought into a, a while ago to scale it up. And one of the things that really, really, when I first joined Legal in General, when I looked at the health and well-being uh, survey, I was staggered that s there was so much financial distress, or so much distress from financial well-being. And here we were. We had more uh, programs than you could ever imagine on helping people financially, but 40% of all of our people were suffering through, through financial, even as the most financially educated group. And we see that everywhere, is that there's this huge financial stress. And one of the things that we've done is to help to set up salary finance, fund it and grow it, because it really helps financial well-being and financial uh, resistance. Let me tell you, it doesn't make any money to today, but it is a door that leads to a door that leads to a door for, for us as a firm. And it's opened our eyes as to how much of that is still around there as a problem. And this, you know, we'd much rather people did financing through the workplace through th than through payday lending and that will result in much better outcomes uh, for everyone. And we want to be part of that at Legal and General. People say, well, it's actually part of your business. And I think, you know what, it, it is part of our business because actually the financial well-being of our customers is at the heart of what we do. And it's no good giving them great returns on their pension scheme over here as if they can't actually solve you know, everyday life problems over here. And we have to you know, be a joined up company and sort these things out. Right, Nigel, thank you enormously. I think we've got some really important points out there about the crucial importance now of trust, uh, about joining up all of these, these different pillars of, of, of activity and recognizing that business has to be in this for the long term. Nigel, thank you so thank much. You, thank you. Thank you very much.